Welcome to Talk Time with Max Contact, the podcast where we talk about the latest contact center and customer experience, industry news, and insights. Join us as we welcome industry experts, discuss actionable strategies you can apply to your business, and help professionals like you on your path to long-term career progression and success. I'm your host, Sean McIver. Hello and welcome to another episode of Talk Time with Max Contact. I'm joined today by Sophia Puccio, who is an experienced customer experience professional who was recently promoted to the position of Associated Product Manager at Curve, a company focused on simplifying the way people spend, save, and see their money. Before Curve, she was a Customer Experience Manager for Cable Bay Vineyards Limited in Auckland, New Zealand. Welcome, Sophia. Um, so. Obviously, we've got that short introduction from yourself. Tell us a bit more about your background. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here today. Well, my journey with customer experience was a little bit different from the usual. I started working in data in 2017. I worked for a couple of companies. I am from Argentina, so I worked there for big companies just such as Amex or Zurich Insurance. I've been always working more in the technical side of things, so working a lot with engineers, with IT, with data teams. And after five years, when I finished uni, I found out that I was missing a lot of people skills, soft skills. I had a strong background in technology and I had very good technical skills, but I felt I was missing soft skills, people skills, and I didn't know how to motivate people. And also in execs or like bosses around me, I always found out that they also struggle with those kind of things. So I just say, well, I want to be the best on this. I know that having good people skills, good soft skills would help me and help any company I, I work in. So I decided to move to New Zealand and there I tried to focus my career and start all over again in customer experience. It was quite interesting. I've been working leading teams for a couple of years there, mainly in hospitality, because I thought, well, who, who's the best people to talk about this customer experience? I think it's hospitality. They know what they're doing. New Zealand has such a good level of hospitality, high standards. So I've learned quite a lot there. Obviously, my technical experience also helped me to understand better and to catch up quicker with, with things. So I work in purely customer service and customer experience. They are managing teams of 25 to 30 people. We were serving people. I work in vineyards, as you say, like we have huge restaurants with wine tastings. It was like pure customer experience and pure customer service. And that allowed me to be where I am today, I think. After that, I joined Corv. I joined Corv yeah, from a like customer experience for purely perspective. And I helped them with my technical background and with my new customer experience background to prepare better tooling for the team to help us to build better ways to communicate with customers. And recently I've been promoted to product manager at Core. So here I am. So first things first, congratulations on your promotion. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really happy. That's a big yeah. step up. That's fantastic. So let me ask then, why Curve? What drew you to Curve as an organization? Because it's quite the jump to go from Cable Bay Vineyards to Curve. That's quite a jump. What drew you to the organization? Well, actually, I had a friend that was working at the company and she told me about the service, the product that they had, the, all these new things that I didn't know about startups because I've never worked in a startup until I joined Curve. So it was something completely different from hospitality it was something completely different from working in established companies like such Amex or Zurich. So I say, well, this is something completely different, different in which I can apply all my skills, my set skill set. So the technical part and also the customer experience part that I work on that separately, I thought, okay, well, this is something in which I can apply both and I can use all of this experience to build something different, to do something different. So because of that, I joined Curve, I think it was April 2020. And yeah, and here I am. Excellent. So it's interesting that you were talking about the crossover between the technical side versus the customer experience side, which 
For me, I think that's a really important bridge to make because it's easy to do something that's not easy, but it's possible to do something that is functional from a technical point of view, but is frustrating from a customer point of view. So let's talk about the customer journey then. So in the customer experience, for you, what defines a successful customer journey or a successful customer experience? How do we define that, first of all? Well, I think... There are two parts of two points of view you need to address in this case. I think the point of view of the customer, so building and developing your service or your product, having the customer as the center of the mindset, or so thinking about them. And also from a customer perspective, to have a smooth and clear path through the product or through the experience or through the service or whatever you're building for a customer. So I think Obviously, having the customer in the center of the mindset and thinking about the customer first, and also from a customer perspective, like having a smooth and a clear path and a clear way to go through the product or the experience itself. I think that's kind of the top of the iceberg where you need to start off and also keep that in mind along the journey. Because I've noticed that some companies start their ways or their journeys from, okay, I, we have the customer in the middle of the mindset, but then that gets lost in the way because revenue things or because like, we want to grow or because whatever. I think that keeping the, the customer along the journey of the company in the middle of the mindset is really, really important. That makes sense. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I think the having a, a customer first mindset in everything that we do is so critically important. So, on the back of that, in terms of what you're doing at Curve um, as an associated product manager, tell me about your focus on customer engagement. How are you driving that at Curve? What does that look like? Well, it's been different. So we've been when I first joined Curve, we were looking at okay, we want to grow the customer base, we want to reach more customers, we want to be able to know us. And now we are getting into a phase in which we want to provide the best service, we want to listen to customers. And that's why I've been kind of been pushed to the product team because I have such a heavy customer service experience and I understood customer service and I understood customer issues, that's why I'm being kind of drew into this product manager role. It's really valuable what Corb is doing right now, that is listening to customers, going to the basis and users using CX levers as a way to fix the product. So right now we are focusing on the customer because we are focusing on quality. We want not to release new features. We want to know what the customer wants. We want to know why people is contacting CX, why people are getting in touch with us, why the, this is happening. We want to allow them to self-serve themselves. If they want, for example, we are right now working a new feature to allow customers to reorder cars in the app when now they need to contact CX, we want to allow them to go to the app and order the car themselves instead of having all this process or all this journey. So right now, I think, yeah, the customer journey or curve is like, we want to listen to customers. We want to share with them what we're doing. We want them to bold about features. Well, you know, I think right now we are focusing on that. We want to listen to the customer. We want to bring the customer back to the middle, to the center, to the core of curve. I love that. <laughs> That's a pretty good mission statement as far as mission statements go. Yeah, I'm 100% behind that. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here and we want to talk about AI and I want to talk about AI today and in some detail because it's somewhat polarizing within the industry. In my experience, from what I've read, from everything that I've seen, it's somewhat polarizing and I want to dig into it, but we'll start at the highest level. I want to begin talking about the role that AI, artificial intelligence, plays in a customer engagement process or a customer experience process. So I guess I'll start off by saying how much of the process is automated from yourselves and how did you identify what would be best suited to be an area or a bottleneck that should be automated? Okay, I think this is a good question. So we are trying to use AI to first provide us with better data or with better information about what a customer does with our app, with our interactions or in any time when they are communicating with us or with our product. Once we have that, we did kind of a very deep analysis on how people interact with us and what they want from us. 
And then I think we are now using AI to provide customers with better information, with better or clear, more clear things that they need. What we are doing is trying to use, for example, device basic of AI, the chatbots to provide better data to our agents to just solve an issue quickly. So instead of you getting to talk with someone and then waiting for them to get back to you, we are using the AI to ask the right questions depending the issue they are using. So that was kind of the first step we did using AI in CX. So, and I think it also enable our agents to be more confident because when they receive a case, they have all the tools they need to solve the case instead of trying to understand what's happening or to go in in three different platforms to understand, okay, this customer has this issue. If we ask the right questions, if we pull through information from different platforms to the agents and the agents just need to look at what platform with all the data and all the information that the AI is providing to them is also much better for them and they have more confidence on themselves and it's just the whole thing. It's also a little bit dangerous because you can use AI a lot and you can just try to self-serve or try to send people to talk with these chatbots or to do things by themselves. But I think you also need to provide that shortcut for people to say, I want to talk with a real human. I don't want to use this path anymore. So you need to be careful. Like AI is very important and I think is it can really change the game for everyone, but you also need to provide that shortcut to say, wait, I'm overwhelmed. I just want to talk with someone. I don't want to keep going through this. It's, it's hard to balance sometimes because you say, wow, we are using AI, AI and this is working really well and we want to push all the customers there. But maybe, I don't know, my grandma is using the app for some reason and she doesn't know or she doesn't understand that she needs to talk with these chatbots or to provide different data. So they just want to talk with an agent. They just want to talk with a real human. And also providing that shortcut that says, well, now I don't want to do this anymore and I want to talk to someone. It's also really, really important and also gives us the possibility to create confidence, to provide more confidence to the customers. It's like, okay, they are trying to help me this way, but I can also go this way. So the interaction with people, we want to keep that. We want to keep our agent talking to people. We want to keep that, that human interaction as well, but also using all these new tools or these new projects and things that, that we want to push over. But slowly, slowly, I think we will get there. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I was reading some market research recently. It was saying, unsurprisingly, that it's something ridiculous, like 99% of customer providers or companies looking to investigate how AI can benefit their business in the next five years. And that makes perfect sense. You want to streamline the process. But I think with more companies wanting to leverage kind of those operational cost savings and economies that they can make that come from AI, we're seeing an increase in customer frustration. Some companies push to self-serve or automation processes so strongly that it can actually be difficult to get to a human interaction. So you talked about one of the ways of combating that being always provide an exit point to get to a human. Is there anything else that we can do to get the best from AI while still kind of remaining customer focused and you know, protecting the brand and delivering that customer experience? I think, well, obviously having that shortcut is important, but we also want to try to get people using the AI and using our, these new services and these new processes. So as I think apart from that, what you need to do is really know your customers, know your product, know your features, and try to push for that. Having also very clear information to the public, I think it's really important. Having a good uh, help center in which you can interact with things, you can read things. We also have a community, for example, in which people interact with all their customers and they help each other. So having that is also another thing that I think it helps people to go through that and to trust these AI processes and the, these things. And I also think that you need to understand and start small with AI and grab the data to keep improving your processes. That's also really important. If you want to just streamline everything in one at once and send everything through this AI, 
it's not going to work. It's a process. I think it's a process, it's a slow process in which you learn about customers and customers learn about you. And then with trust, they will keep on using that and they will like it at the end because it's helping them to save time and it's helping you to save time. So I think starting slowly, starting from something small, start trying or testing or using even A-B testing to do, okay, we will serve these customers in this way and then we will serve these customers in this other way and see what works better. Is this proof and error and then coming back to the same things? And yeah, I think the, the slow process is really important. And understand every step of the process and documenting that. This is something that also we, we've seen in, in the company. And is, I think it's, a, it's general to startups, documenting things, having like good books of conduct, how we do our processes, how we follow this, what was the experience when we first implemented it, what, how that changed and how it's working now, what works better. So I think that's also really, really important. Yeah, just to kind of follow up on that, from my point of view, I remember being at an event and one of the companies was talking around the automation processes that they had brought in using artificial intelligence. And they were saying that they'd started off by, it was a government organization and it was to do with some sort of licensing for fishing. And they said that they'd started there and actually what they realized first was that they hadn't documented the entire process and all of the fail points and break points along that process. And so the first thing they had to do was actually document what the process itself was. Once they'd done that, they then realized actually that wasn't in a position to automate immediately and they had to start much smaller but they used that as a learning point to then say, right, how would we tackle this big, scary one that involves 17 pages of documentation or whatever the case may be? So I think that's a really good point. One of the things that I think has always stuck out to me is that whenever I've used an AI, so if I, I needed to contact Amazon, I will name and shame. I needed to contact Amazon recently to return an item and the AI chatbot guided me through a process, but it was very depersonalized. It was very robotic. There's no other way of putting it. It was very depersonalized. And then I got to a dead end along that journey. It was just like, you cannot do this via this mechanism. And I didn't have the break point to get out to a human. But I just wondered, how do you avoid the depersonalization risks that many people associate with artificial intelligence? Because by its very nature, it is depersonalized. Is there anything you can do to mitigate that? I guess that to mitigate this personalized thing, it's like you need to provide better options. Options that, and I come back to the same thing, you need to know your product and you need to know your customers. And obviously it's a process that you, maybe you start with this thing that is a little bit depersonalized, but then if you want to improve it, you need to make sure that you read your data, that you use that data, that the AI and the ML as well produced for you and to keep improving that process every time. So it's not like, okay, I will launch this AI process in the app and then I will leave it there. It's a journey. It's not just releasing something and then stopping there and I leave it there. Also, a thing that I found really interesting in this investigation is using some tools of natural language that will read the sentiment of the customer. That is not just reading the content of what they're saying. They are reading the sentiment and focusing on that is so rich. Like looking at, okay, this customer is angry about this. This customer is overwhelmed about that. And also looking at that, like what's the sentiment that this is producing to customer, then it helps you to tweak the process and to make it more personalized and more understandable for them. And just, you know, sending them through the right, the right way or the right path for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think detecting, particularly in the, through the automation stage, when you are engaging with a chatbot, as you're working through that process, if there's a mechanism there to detect frustration in responses or even just to recognize when someone's just mashing the keyboard and being able to pass that information forward to the user that then interacts with the customer, they're forewarned. They know that the customer is agitated. They can be prepared to deal with that. So yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I think it's interesting that you touched on sentiment. In my space, in my universe, there's a lot around speech analytics. And it's interesting that we talk about speech analytics as what was said but then you've also got speech sentiment, which is what was meant. 
And there's a long and large difference between me saying, yeah, it's fine. And me saying, yeah, that's fine. They're two different things. Absolutely. It's the classic example everybody always goes to because they're the same words, but you are not saying the same thing. So yeah, I absolutely understand where you're coming from. It's interesting that just to cycle back a little, we've spoken about it's important to have the data to be able to make these iterative decisions and find and identify those wins. So AI, artificial intelligence, can generate huge amounts of data-driven insights. But is that there must be a risk of kind of being overwhelmed with just all of the data. How do you determine what's the best data to start with? Where do you even begin with looking at, this is my starting point, this is the thread I'm going to pull from this tangle? Well, I think going back a little bit, you need to know how to build your data. So how what you want to collect from it, these interactions. And we've been lucky, we partnered with this company called Customer with the K. I don't know if you know it. It's been brought by Meta recently. And they provide you with a CRM CX tool that you can build your own data, you can produce your own data, you can collect what you think is important. So starting there, try to get a tool, try to use a tool that allows you to collect your own data, to create your own data. Also, maybe you can build an in-house app that will collect this data for you, that will provide this for you. And I've been involved in the process of actually sitting down with products, sitting down with data and analysis. I had the opportunity to sit down with product teams and with data teams and with CX teams and agree on what data we want to see there, what, what, what data we want to produce, what events we want to track. Where those responses from the chatbot are going to be collected? What are the touch points we want to look at? So what I think the first thing you need to do is understand the product, understand where the issues can be, and then build your data having this in mind. For a contact center, I would say first try to track what's the reason why they are contacting you. I think that's the first thread you need to pull from that why they're contacting you, what they want from you, why they didn't solve their, themselves or why they want to talk to your team. And I think, well, the sentiment as well is quite important because maybe that would help you to say, look, people are getting really frustrated about this issue, so let's tackle that. Even if it's not a huge thing, let's tackle that because that's frustrating people. So first thing, contact reasons and then the sentiment as well. From there, you can create anything you want. For example, for customers who are turning, who are leaving us, like, why are you leaving us? Like, can you just give us a reason why you're leaving us? So start with like broad information and then kind of steam that line into, okay, we want about this issue. Okay, we identify that this is an issue that customers are contacting us about. This is the first thing we, we know. Well, what do we want to know about this? We want to know the device of that customer, what other data we want to collect. So let's ask that to the customer or let's ask this or that, or let's instruct the customer to do different things. I think it's a whole process or a whole journey. Like if you can get the right tool for you that will produce your own data, you are the, the owner of everything, you own your data. You can also build an extra column and pull different data and say, okay, I want to know what time of the day they're contacting us because I want to know when I need to allocate more agents or less agents. So I want to create this data. I want to create something. And that's really, really important. I think obviously having the right tool is essential. And then knowing your product and your business itself is also something that can help you a lot. Absolutely. Yes. And I think that understanding the customer journey, understanding the pain points, understanding the frustrations of why they need to get in touch, why they were unable to successfully self-serve, even if it's just that they didn't want to self-serve, should then drive those are the areas to focus on. That tracks for me. One of the interesting things I find is that whenever artificial intelligence or chatbots or speech analytics comes up in a conversation is that it's very often almost universally geared around the customer experience. Now, I just want to flip that on its head very briefly and just say, is there an opportunity to utilize those same tools to look at the user experience from the internal point of view within the business and say, actually, our business, our users have these bottlenecks. Is there an opportunity for that? I think 100%, yes. You should be using it like that. Okay, 
like having CX level to fix our product, to prioritize releases, to understand what the customer wants. Is that's that's essential and, and it's really, really important. Having that journey that the customer does and also looking at even analytics, simple analytics from where are they clicking, where are they going, what are they doing, why they're not finding the right answer. Also, that is something super, super valuable. Excellent. You talked earlier on about the, the particular data gathering software that you use. How can an organization go around identifying the best solution for them? Do they need to know the questions that they want the answers to first or the first step? What's that? If we think about company X out there in the world who's deciding to embark on this journey, where's their starting point? Because there's an awful lot out there and it can be overwhelming. I agree. And then there is always companies trying to tell you like, this is the best product ever. This is a perfect, like you need to use this one, like all, yeah, this will save your life. I would like doing when I have something like this presenting to me is maybe start looking at, okay, what is exactly what we need? So let's try to put together what we need. Like not looking at tools, not looking at anything, some conceptual perspective or conceptual point of view. What is that what we want from this tool? Do we need like something to create and get, gather data? We need something just to communicate with customers. We need something that will allow us to create AI and we want to implement all these processes. So first of all, looking at yourselves, looking at your company, at your organization, looking at what you need. I think that's the start point, like not looking at tools or going around, oh, well, this can do this or that can do that. First, knowing your needs and knowing what you want. And using that to go to the companies and say, look, this is what I want. What can you provide? And then obviously they will come up with other things. So we can pro- also can provide this or that, or they will come and, and, and add more value probably. But first of all, you need to know what you want. You need to understand what's your needs. Because if you just go to see and, okay, I want to see what is out there, you will get overwhelmed because you won't understand what you need at that point. You will receive a lot of data and a lot of proposals and a lot of information. So first of all, understand your needs, then go to the companies, try to get a demo, try to speak with the sales rep, try to understand what other value can add from apart from what you exactly need and apart from your essential needs, let's say. And after that, obviously, maybe getting in touch with other companies that can that use their services or try to, you know, sneak around and ask other companies, hey, what are you doing? Like, how is this company? And I think it's something really nice happening in the industry that people are really keen to tell you, like, oh, I jump with, with Yone Cole and I tell you, like, it's really, really valuable. And I think it's really good that it's happening. It's not just, okay, we are competitors and that's it. It's like, well... If we all go forward and we all improve and everything is like, it's an industry thing. It's, it, that is really good. I think one of the things that's always struck me as being really, it's made me feel really positive is that in any conversation that I've had with a group of people from the industry that's particularly around anything like speech analytics or artificial intelligence or chatbots, whenever I'm in those conversations, I think because it's right on the bleeding edge of where the industry is going, everyone's really keen to share. Everyone wants to say, oh, yeah, we're doing this thing with it. And this is really interesting. And then someone else will jump in and go, oh, we've gone and done this instead. And it generates that that enthusiasm, I think. Everyone's keen to learn because it's new, because we're pushing the boundaries and pushing the envelope. I think... One of the things I'm curious about, and this is maybe a little bit of a spin on it, but if we look at the contact center industry as a whole, over the last three years, probably, we've gone through a massive transformation that's been forced on everybody as a result of recent events. And what's happened is we've had the great resignation. A lot of people have reassessed their lives and they've said, this isn't for me. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go and do something else, which has made retention of staff a focus, it's made recruitment of the right staff a focus, training is a focus, all of those things have been critically important. Is there a role, or rather, what role can AI play in alleviating the threat of employee burnout? 
And I know that that's a very big question, but I think that, again, if we're talking about where are the problems, if we talk about the industry, that's a problem area. And I think it's worth just asking that question. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point because also employee burnout is something that is coming up a lot because people are tired and because best employees or long stay employees are doing more work to train new staff or to help new joiners to get up to speed. So I will come back to something that I said before, that is help using AI to provide one simple way for agents or for contact center staff to go and understand what's happening in one place and having all the data that AI has con- collect for them and having all the information that they need to solve an issue on one touch. So they get it something, they get a problem and they are able to solve it themselves. I think that's the main thing that AI can do for contact center in place. Provide, grab data from different places, grab information from the customer itself, grab different part of the journey and put everything together in one place for customers and their agents to go there and boom, I know what I'm doing. I'm confident. I have everything that I need to solve this issue. I don't need to go around and ask things to anyone. I don't need to jump to a different platform to look for different things. I have everything here. So that's the main thing that that AI can do moving forward. And actually they can do it right now for, for contact centers. Absolutely. I think there's historically, there's been something of a cloud hanging over the average contact center staff member around kind of they don't really they're challenging to work with or they're challenging to manage and i think it's worth pointing out that no one wants to come into work no one sets out to go to work to do a bad job and actually if your staff are feeling like they're challenged and able to provide a good customer service then that's going to mean that they're not going to feel fulfilled in the role And I guess if you can get to a point where you understand the data points and the metrics and you're able to provide the user as the customer's presented to them, you're able to provide them with the information they need to be able to effectively resolve the problem, then they're going to feel more fulfilled because they're resolving the problem more. Especially as now, where we've got the self-serve there, we're handling all of that over here. So what is being discussed with the user is that much more complex. And I think that's a key thing that people often forget, that that dynamic shift is going to, it's only going to get more. It's only going to get more complex. And I'm aware we've only got a minute left, so I'll I'll, I'll pass back to you to reply. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I think that, as you say, like as we move a little bit from that idea, now we have the self-serve, which is like the first line. And now our agents of first line became actually second line because they're dealing with harder cases and providing really, really, really a lot of value to, to the company. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you ever so much for today, Sophia. It's been the most engaging conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. I've really enjoyed this. I haven't talked about AI and automation in a long time, and it's been really good. Thank you so much. Awesome. No problem. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Anytime at all. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Talk Time is brought to you by Max Contact. To find out more about Max Contact and how our customer engagement software can help you and your teams provide smarter customer experiences, visit maxcontact.com and book your personalized demo today. Be sure to search Talk Time with Max Contact in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found, and leave us a positive rating to help other like-minded individuals join the conversation. Finally, before you go, never miss a future episode by clicking the subscribe button and turning on notifications. On behalf of the team here at Max Contact, thanks for listening.